not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I am talking about genuine peace, not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women, not merely peace in our time, peace in all time. We must walk on in the days ahead with an audacious faith in the future. Let us realize that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. probably your strongest muscle. You may not even know it's your strongest muscle, but it, it's your imagination, using the mind that God has given you to imagine. And I want you just to kind of, and some of you will be able to do this really well, some of you will be a little harder for you, but I want you just to pick, imagine yourself in a desert, not like in an RV vacationing in the desert, I mean like in a desert desert. And there's no water, and, you can, and you're stuck there. And your, your mouth is so dry, it's like cotton. Your lips are cracking. You, you, if, if you had $1,000 and someone said, I'll give you a small cup of cold water, you'd pay $1,000 without even thinking. I mean, you're, just, you're parched and you're thirsty and you're, and you're just longing for water. And, and then, kind of out of nowhere, all of a sudden, you feel something. Just this little, little drop. And you, you look up. You realize it's a, it's a raindrop. So you open your mouth, just, just in case one more comes. You're just kind of like you're opening your mouth, hoping one more drop. And, and then a moment later, you hear the sound, this little, this little, thoop, thoop, thoop. And you kind of look, and you see a couple of little raindrop spots in the sand. And your heart just kind of begins to fill with hope. You go, could it be? And, and then, and then the, the rain starts coming. And then it just starts just pouring down. You open your mouth. You drink it in. And then you watch, and, and as happens in the desert when rain comes like that, all of a sudden, th these hundreds of raindrops, these thousands, these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of raindrops begin to pool together and fill the parched land, and, and you see this little trickle, this little, this little trickle, and then it becomes a stream. And there's places in the world in the deserts when the rain comes like that, that all of a sudden the wadis and the wastelands begin to flow with living water. And cisterns that have been dry and empty for months just get filled up with floods of fresh water. And there's, there's this living stream of water. This is the biblical picture of justice, of the righteousness of God. That it would come so fully and so completely that it becomes like a stream, like a river of God's goodness. And it comes drop by drop and drip by drip. And for so many of us, when we think about the topic of justice, we look at the world and the, 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 the ills and the evils of the world and we're just overwhelmed. And we freeze. And we do nothing because it's so big, what could I do? But you see, justice comes like a river only when it comes drip by drip and drop by drop. And so, so you show up to church one Sunday morning, and you don't just bring offering to put in the offering plate, you, you bring along a few cans of, of items to put in the, in the food pantry so that this Tuesday and Thursday, like every Tuesday and Thursday, when people come here and they're arid and they're dry and they're struggling, and the river of God's grace and goodness and justice floods them. And so you come and you, and you put these in, in our little container. You open up and you kind of go drip, drip, drip. And you go, what difference does that make? Boy, it makes a lot of difference when everybody is dripping a little bit. When everybody's doing something. Doing their part, their little part. And it makes a difference. It's a drip and a drop when you're walking along and it's a cold night and it's one, of those, it's one of those cold, foggy, Monterey nights and you see somebody who's shivering and cold and they don't have a coat. And you think to yourself, well, not only am I wearing a coat, but I have 47 other coats at home in my closet, plural. And so you take off your coat and you bring it over to the other person and you say, here, this is for you. And if you're really bold, you say something like, Jesus told me to give it to you. Because in a way, he kind of did. And, and just one more drip, one more drop. But when those drips and drops collect, they make a trickle, and that trickle makes a stream, and that stream brings the justice of God to the world. This is a little picture of two little kids, of Juan Francisco 
and of Andrea Michelle. This little boy and girl live in one of the poorest parts of El Salvador. And a family in our church every month, drip, drop, writes a check for $38 for each kid. And well, what difference does that make? Well, it makes a lot of difference to Juan Francisco and to Andrea. See, we get paralyzed because of the bigness of the problems of the world, and we don't realize that if we will just let the justice and the goodness and the grace of God flow through us in our own way every day, that creates a river of God's goodness, and it changes the world. And you can say, well, what difference does it make to, to write a check through Compassion International? By the way, these are two of hundreds of children that are supported in that same area of El Salvador, where most of the dads have left, and most of the moms are in utter poverty, poverty. And these are two of hundreds of children that are supported by people who are part of this church. We, we have taken ownership of that part of the world as best we can, and we are giving and loving and caring. And it matters to them because, because of that little gift each month. It's an extra bag of groceries. It's school, including learning about Jesus. It's medical care. And hopefully, it's personal notes written back and forth encouraging these little ones to love Jesus and to stay in school and to, and to, to live a new kind of life. And, and, and just bit by bit, drip by drip. You know, when, when we share the word of God with someone whose soul is arid and longing for something that lasts forever and we share the love of Jesus through the word of God, that is a form of justice. That is a form of pouring out of the goodness and the love of God. When we give someone a cup of cold water, in the name of Jesus, that small act, you know, drip, drop, whatever it is, justice comes in many shapes and sizes and types, but it needs to come. And if it's going to become a, a flowing river of God's justice, it's going to start by lots of just little raindrops of God's goodness and God's grace. Here's the question today. And over these next three weeks that we're going to be thinking about together. What is justice? What do we mean when we talk about justice? Especially in a church, especially as Christians. You know, what is justice? And, and, and here's a simple definition. It's attitudes and actions that are consistent with God's will and ways. That, that's really the best biblical definition of justice that I can give to you. It's attitudes, how we see the world, and then actions, how we're moved to action from our attitudes that have changed because we walk close with Jesus, that are consistent with God's will and God's ways. Every time we do something to help those who are outcast and broken and oppressed and forgotten, because God, God says, care about the widow and the orphan and the sojourner, the person who's homeless. God says, care about them. And when we align ourselves with the heart of God and the will of God and our attitudes become like the heart of God and then our actions in small and big ways live out the heart and the will of God, that's just a drip, drop, drip, drop. And here's the problem. Most of us look and say, what difference does my little drip or my little drop make? And if everyone has that attitude, there's never gonna be a roaring river. But if everyone who loves Jesus, who's part of Shoreline Church, we have thousands of people who are part of this church. If we all live that out, and then the other churches around our community, and there's lots of them. So over 300,000 churches just in the United States of America. Could you imagine those 300,000 churches and those who named the name of Jesus just when God opened the door and gave an opportunity, did their little part? You know, I've, got, I've got two shirts hanging right here. These, I saw these in my closet this morning. They're almost brand new. I don't think I've worn either shirt for six or eight months. So I brought them to hang them there because when the services, third service is done today, they're going to go in our clothing closet. There's a place to put those over there. And you go, well, it's, it's, just, it's just two shirts. Yeah, that's all it is to me, and I probably won't wear them for another six months. But we have a clothing closet at Shoreline, and every Tuesday and every Thursday, people come here who are trying to find a job and can't dress for the job, or who have a simple need, and we can meet those needs. It's just these little drips and drops that make a difference. And, and so we need to understand, when we're talking about justice, we're talking about, about attitudes and actions that, that reflect the heart of God. Understand also that justice and righteousness in the Bible hold a very similar meaning. 
In the Bible, in the Bible, the, the, the word for the, that we translate justice and righteousness is actually the same word. It's the same concept. And, and in, in the book of Amos, if you have your Bibles, look with me at Amos chapter 5. In Amos chapter 5, there's kind of this famous verse about, that shows how these two relate to each other. And it's actually Hebrew, it's a Hebrew parallel construction where the two lines are saying the same thing. And so, and so in Amos 5, verse 24, we read this. But let justice roll on like a river. That's a beautiful picture. Righteousness like a never failing stream. In desert, arid places where most of the Bible was lived out in Bible times, a river would show up and if it would begin to rain, there would be a rush of water, but in hours or days later, it would be gone. But the vision here is righteousness like a never failing stream. Justice and righteousness have that same meaning, doing the right things that God desires, that God wants. But when you read this passage in Amos chapter 5, you can't miss what comes before it because what God is saying to the people is he's saying, there's some things you're doing, but you're not living out justice and righteousness. So the good things you're doing don't really have much impact because you're not fulfilling my way of living in the world. And so listen to what God says to his people in Amos chapter 5, starting in verse 22. Just listen to these words. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings... I will not accept them. So wait a minute, I thought God likes offerings. He does, but the point is there's something missing. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, God says, I will have no regard for them. Why? Because something's wrong. Verse 23, this is a shocking one. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Say, well, God doesn't like worship? No, that's not the point at all. God loves worship. But right after that comes these words. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. You get the picture? He's saying, I want your worship, I want your offerings, but I also want your heart and your life. And if all you're doing is worshiping, but you're not actually caring about the world and caring about the people right in your own home, then you're missing something. God is waking us up to the call to live lives that reflect his just and righteous presence in the world. Now, as we launch into a three-week series, and I'm really excited about next week, we have Josh Butler coming and preaching, and Josh will bring a great message to our hearts, and I'm going to wrap up the week afterwards as we spend three weeks talking about justice. I also want to clarify what justice is not. I think sometimes when you talk about what something is, it helps to be clear about what it isn't. So justice is not... Verbally declaring support of current trends or hot topics. For some people, you know, justice is whatever the hot topic is, I'm for that, I'm against that. And it's not just verbally saying, I'm against that or I'm for that. You can have a bumper sticker that says, feed the hungry, and you never give up anything and never give any food for people that are hungry, but you got the bumper sticker, that's not justice. It, justice isn't about being angry about the way the world is and doing nothing about it. Justice is attitudes that are shaped by the heart of God and actions that follow it. And so, so there's, there's more to justice than just an emotional response. It moves us to action, to that drip, drip, and drop, drop of the goodness of God. I think we have to also acknowledge that injustice is easy. Injustice is such an easy path. Anytime our attitudes and actions do not line up with God's will and God's ways, we're walking in the realm of injustice. When my life and God's will don't align, I'm living in injustice. Why? Because justice is attitudes and actions that reflect the heart of God. When our attitudes and actions are lined up with the will of God. So when I'm not living that way, I can actually become an agent of injustice in little and in big ways. If I'm a gossip and I speak ill of other people, and I tear down their character, I'm not living in line with God's will, I'm living apart from that, and it's an injustice. I'm creating an injustice for that other person because I'm saying things about them that aren't true, or might be true, but it's nobody's business. And my mouth becomes an agent of injustice. It's, it's, if, you, if I said to you, well, injustice is having an attitude that doesn't perfectly reflect the heart of God, you go, well, man, I could be unjust easily. Well, it's actions that don't reflect the will of God. We have to be careful. Not only to point at injustice out there, but to say, God, is there injustice in here? Am I not lining up and aligning with the will and the heart of God? It's way too easy to point fingers at everyone else. 
It's much harder to stop and reflect and say, God, what does it look like for me to live and to walk in justice? Now, justice is a massive topic, and the Bible has lots of different ways it talks about it. We could do, we could do months on the topic of justice. We're just gonna do these three weeks for right now, but, but I want you to understand that there's, there's a lot to this topic. Here's some of the aspects when you start talking about justice from a biblical standpoint. Justice is about the character of God. He is just and the author of justice. If you wanna understand what justice is, you have to look at the heart of God. We don't define what is just and unjust. God does. Also, when you talk about biblical justice, it's God's justice at the end of time. To understand that at the end of time, all things will be made right. And those, thing, those things that are unjust and wrong, God says, it will be reconciled one day. Justice is understanding God's justice now in our world. That God wants his people to drip, drop, Love, serve, care, and bring justice so it becomes a trickle and then a stream and then a never-ending stream in the world now. If you're gonna talk about justice from a biblical standpoint, you talk about Jesus' work on the cross. You can't talk about justice as Christians and not talk about Jesus because we've sinned and broken the just requirements of God and we couldn't pay for those sins, but Jesus came and paid the just penalty for all of my sins and all of your sins. He satisfied the just requirement and brought us back into line with the Father if we'll simply accept his grace. That's part of the story of justice in the Bible. Injustice around the world and how we live justly is part of the discussion. There are massive injustices and these are the kind of things that we can look at and hear about and read about and it's so big and it's so massive that we just kind of freeze. And we say, I, there's nothing I can do. It's so far away. It's so big. There's nothing I can do. So oftentimes what we then do is nothing. And I think what we need to say is, God, what would you have me do? Is there something you'd have me do right in my home, right in my neighborhood, in my nation, or in the world? And we respond to the leading of God. And sometimes God opens the door for an act of justice, and we respond. Sometimes God doesn't open the door. That's okay, but we make ourselves available. I was driving into church this morning, and we, have, we actually have a meeting with part of, the, part of our leadership team who leads the services and stuff in the, in the uh, Connections Cafe at 745. And then we have another group that meets for the worship team in here, uh, over here under the exit sign in, in the uh, hallway there. And so I go to both those meetings. So I'm, dr I'm driving in, and as I'm coming down Garden Road, there's this car to the side of the road that is broken down, and there's a car next to it with jumper cables, and they're trying to get the car started. And the car that was kind of helping them out was sort of blocking the road. So I kind of looked to make sure it was clear and drove around and just kept on driving. So because I was looking at my clock and, and I need to get to church so I can have prayer time and then I can preach about justice. As I'm driving by, somebody stuck on the side of the road and I, and I, and I felt like the Holy Spirit said, go back, go back and check on them. Make sure they're okay. And I kind of, and I, so I then, you know, how you, do you ever negotiate with God? I do that sometimes. I said, well, well am I, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one. But I, well, well, Lord, there's somebody helping them already. But I just felt like God said, turn around and go back. So I turned around, but I looked at my clock, but I'm going to be late for prayer time. I don't want to get in trouble from Pastor Sean because I'm late for prayer time, you know. <laughs> but um, I, so, but I, I listened to the Holy Spirit, and I turned around and went back, and I kind of pulled, nose, nosed up against the other car, and I just opened my window, and I said, hey, I said, are you, can I help? Do you need anything? And, and they said, oh, no, we're, that, we're all set. We're good. No problem. Have a good morning. I'm like, okay. But, but it, was, it was one of those moments where I just felt like I need to at least say, can I do something? And that was my part. Now, they said, I don't need you. We don't need you right now. But you know, had I been gotten here late for prayer time, would that have been okay? I, I, yes. And, and the, but those moments present themselves in lots of different ways, in epic big things far away and little things close by. But we need to be available and responsive to the Holy Spirit and understand that, that, that there's, there's big needs and small needs. Injustice in our lives and how to live justly. That's part of the topic of justice in the Bible. Part of the journey of justice is not just pointing a finger far away, but actually looking at your own life and saying, okay, Kevin, how am I acting in ways that aren't in line with the will of God and bringing little injustices or big injustices right in my home, right in my workplace, right on my school campus, right in my neighborhood? Are there things that, are, there, there's some things I go, I, I can't change that big thing out there, but there's lots of things right where I live, I can change it right now because I can look and go, I'm not lined up with God's will. And when I bring it into alignment, that brings the just and the right, righteous heart of God to my life. 
We can all be agents of justice and righteousness in little ways and big ways. And also, how the church, God's people, can become a community of justice. We have to ask this question. You know, Monterey County would be a dramatically different place if every Christian in every church was engaged in just doing their small parts to show the love and the grace and the helping hands of Jesus, to, to move into acts of justice. And, and I think that our community is different because we have lots of churches that are doing that, but I think more and more so we could walk into this and see what God would do. I mean, what would happen if every Christian in Monterey County was just responsive to the Holy Spirit and open and available if God said, you know, you can help right there? What, what would happen if every person who was part of Shoreline Church and every other church in the area, every, every week when they went grocery shopping or shopped online and had it delivered to their house or whatever it is, would just you know, get one or two extra items and say, I'm getting this to give to the food pantry here or to some other food pantry in our community. Can you imagine strolling with thousands of people? If you, if, if you said, every time I go shopping, I'm gonna grab one, uh, whatever for me and my family, and then one thing for someone else. And some of you are like, well, I go shopping six days a week. Well, then that means you get six things. You might settle down with all your shopping, maybe. But, um, you, know, but you go, okay, and, but, and, and I, I, don't go, I don't go to my pantry and find like the old beat up can of cream corn, right? Uh, and say, and, say, and it's rusty and it's two years over, you know, out of date, it should be thrown. Oh, I'll give this to the food pantry. We don't, don't do that. Go, go to the food pantry and pick up the list of the things they need and get one of those each time. You go, you go well, that's, what difference? That's gonna, that's gonna be, you know, one can of mixed vegetables or one can of soup a week. What difference does that make? Well, here's the difference. There's thousands of people who call showing their church home. And if we all do that each time, it makes a difference. It's making a difference. And we wanna see that river flow more and more through our community and through our world. So I want to reflect for a moment and ask you to reflect humbly, just to, in your own heart, to ask these two questions. How often do I think about justice and act on it? I mean, how often do I think, is this the righteous, just thing that honors the heart of God? And, I, and because it is, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna take that step. I'm gonna take that risk. We'll talk two weeks from now about some of the risks and the costs involved because it, it takes something to live this way. But I want you this week just to begin thinking about it and opening your heart to this. Not, not saying, hey, this isn't for me, but saying, if I'm a Christian, this is for all of us. And then the second question is, how often do I fail to notice, ignore, or even cause injustice? Are there times where my silence or my action brings injustice? And, and I think sometimes, I've been thinking about this recently, I think sometimes we look at ourselves and we feel like if that big epic moment came when I needed to stand up for something just and righteous, I want to be that person. The problem is we're not standing up in the teeny little things, so I'm not sure if in the big moments we're going to be ready. And I was, I was thinking about this. I think that, I don't know, this goes through my mind, and maybe you've thought this too, but when you think about like a time in history like when, 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 not Nazi, when, when the Nazis were basically take, not overtaking over Germany, but spreading across the planet. And, and people were being put in boxcars of trains and hauled off and never heard from again. And you say, how does a whole country and a whole part of the world look the other way? Because a lot of people had a sense of what was going on. A radical injustice where an entire group of people are ba basically being exterminated and shipped off and put into labor camps and many, many of them killed. And, and I think sometimes we can sit back historically and we can sit back and go, well, if I had been there, you know, if I was, how, how, did, how did they do that? How could those people let that happen? If I had been there, it would have been different. I think we can start to think that way. You know, as a pastor, I, I know that the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor during the time of Nazi Germany. And Bonhoeffer actively stood and fought against Nazis. And they eventually put him in a prison camp. And a couple days before that camp was liberated, he was executed. He, he paid the final price of his life to stand. I, I would, I would want to think as a pastor, if something like that, if I was in that, that I would make that kind of a stand. But, I, but I'm, not, I'm not sure if I would. I, because I walk past opportunities every day for just teeny little acts of justice, and I often don't do those things. Uh, you, you might not know these names, but, but a, a, uh, a couple um, named uh, Meep and Jan Geese 
were the, the people, them and a couple other folks that protected the Anne, Anne Frank and her family, her parents and her sibling and her, and protected them. And in, in, in actually in a business, in a, like an office business area with its secret rooms. And if you've ever been to, the, to Amsterdam, you might have even walked through this building. But you know, they, they risked their lives protecting uh, someone like Oscar Schindler, who, who did all he could to save lives. We look and say, well, if, if, that, if that kind of injustice happened in my world, I would be Schindler. I would be the, the Gieses. I would be, I would be Bonhoeffer. Are you sure? Because here's the thing. For every Bonhoeffer, there were thousands of pastors in Germany who looked the other way and who said nothing and didn't risk their lives and watched as neighbors and friends were shipped off never to be seen again. You know, for every geese couple, there were tons of other couples who just looked the other way. For every Schindler, there were thousands and tens of thousands of people who did nothing. And I don't know if, if any of us are gonna be ready to do the massive acts of justice if we don't learn right now to do a small act of justice. When's the last time you gave food to someone who was hungry? And we got a food pantry here that every week that you can give to us. When's the last time you went through your closet and instead of standing there saying, I have nothing to wear, when there's 50 outfits? You say, what might somebody else wear that I don't wear? What, what, do we think that way? And, and if we want to be ready for the big moments, we've got to just drip, drop, drip, drop, take those small steps forward. And we do that when we understand that the God that we gather to worship today is a God of justice. Our God is just, and he is the source of all justice. Deuteronomy 32, three to four says this. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock, his works are perfect. Listen to this. And all his ways are just a faithful God who does no wrong. Upright and just is he. Revelation 15, three, this is the heavenly host crying out and they say this. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Listen to this. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. They're saying, our God is a God of justice and truth. And when we walk close to him, it changes us. And then when Jesus entered human history, he brought that spirit, the heart of the Father, came in Jesus Christ, God's only son. In Isaiah chapter nine, verses six and seven, is this prophetic word, and you probably have heard this, maybe familiar to you, but listen to these words. That Isaiah prophesies about Jesus as he's gonna, you know, preparing to come into the world. These words would prepare the way. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it, listen to this, with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Jesus came and his throne is held up by justice and righteousness. And his people who walk with Jesus, we who bear the name Jesus Christ as our Savior, if you're a Christian, you bear his name. If you're not yet a Christian, you become a Christian, you say, I am a Christ follower, I am a Christian, a little Christ. I reflect the heart and the spirit of Jesus in all I do. And that means we walk and live in righteousness and justice. We are called to righteous and just lives. Listen to these words from Isaiah 26, verses seven to nine. The path of the righteous is level. You, the upright one, speaking of God, make the way of the righteous smooth. God prepares a way for us to live this way. He's modeled the way forward. Yes, Lord, walking in your ways, in the ways of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renown are the desire of our hearts. My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. And when you long for God, you become more and more like him. When your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness, learn justice. How will the world see the just and right heart of God? They will see it through you as drip, drop, drip, drop. You love, you serve, you share God's truth and God's word and a cup of cold water and a can of food and a coat on a cold day and, 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 and support. You do, you do something. 
And, and I want to ask, I'm going to invite our worship team to come forward and join me. They're going to just share a quiet time of reflection, and they're going to sing a song, and you can sing along or sit quietly. And I want you to spend just a couple of minutes, and I'm going to pray for this time, just saying, uh, let's just quiet our hearts for a minute here. I just want to ask us just to kind of go into, uh, to take a moment of prayer. And I want to invite you as you listen to this song to, to say, Lord, um, are there things in my life where I'm not lined up with what you want and I'm behaving unjustly in my home, in my workplace, at my school, in my neighborhood, wherever it is? And Lord, are there little places of justice? And Lord, in these next two weeks, will you show me more of what it means to walk and live in justice that drop by drop and drip by drip you can flood your justice through our community and through our world. And so just talk to the Lord about that. Have a quiet moment with him.